Welcome to the Mail Clinic Proceedings February 2022 Issue Summary and Author Insights Podcast. In this fourth installment, we'll hear from Dr. Chan Sung Choi, who finds patients whose etiology of liver disease is secondary to alcohol-associated cirrhosis have worse survival following discharge from the ICU compared with patients with other etiologies. From Dr. Casey Bamer, who examines the progress made for adapting systems to support minimally disruptive medicine for patients with complicated chronic medical conditions. From Dr. Urbaz Bin Riaz, who suggests that direct oral anticoagulants therapy may improve efficacy compared to Delta Perrin without sacrificing safety in many cases. And from Dr. Andrea Opria, who reviews the Society for Perioptive Medicine Quality Improvement, or SPACI, articles on psychiatric drugs and neurologic drugs. So patients with cirrhosis are often critically ill, requiring hospitalization in intensive care units or ICUs. We found that patients whose etiology of liver disease is secondary to alcohol have worse survival following ICU discharge, both within the hospital as well as at 30 days compared to patients with other etiologies. Second, we find that applicability and predictive power of the quick sequential organ failure assessment or the QSOFA score, which is a bedside tool to use to predict sepsis, is limited in patients with cirrhosis as compared to general population. My name is Chan Song Choi. I'm a third year internal medicine resident at the Mayo Clinic campus in Rochester. The article's title is Relationship Between Etiology of Cirrhosis and Survival Amongst Patients Hospitalized in Intensive Care Units. The article will appear in February 2022 issue of Mayo Clinic Proceedings. I have had the privilege of working with numerous co-authors on this article, with the senior author being my mentor, Dr. Douglas Simonetto. Patients with cirrhosis are in a complex state of immune dysregulation, previously delineated as cirrhosis-associated immune dysfunction. And we know that alcohol has a detrimental effect on both innate and adaptive immune system. The aims of our study were threefold. First, we aim to find whether there are differences in survival outcomes in critically ill patients with alcohol-associated cirrhosis admitted to ICU compared to patients with other etiology of cirrhosis and two, to explore whether abstinence improves survival outcomes among those with alcohol-associated cirrhosis. And finally, we also explore the applicability and predictive power of QSOFA score in predicting sepsis in patients with cirrhosis. We found that those with alcohol-associated cirrhosis had worse survival outcome with higher mortality in the hospital following ICU stay, as well as at 30 days of follow-up. The finding was actually seen after adjustment for their severity of liver disease, severity of their critical illness, as well as the presence of sepsis. In addition, alcohol use history prior to ICU admission was found in the majority of our patients, which enabled us to explore the effect of abstinence on outcomes of critically ill patients with alcohol-associated cirrhosis. Surprisingly, our study failed to detect any survival difference based on the abstinence, which was just find as alcohol cessation of at least minimum of six months at both hospitalization as well as a short-term follow-up at 30 days. We believe that this finding perhaps reflect the need for longer abstinence duration to translate into more significant survival outcomes among patients with alcohol-associated cirrhosis and also signals the chronicity of immune dysfunction related to alcohol use. So our findings have two important clinical applications and implications. One is to emphasize alcohol cessation among patients with cirrhosis and to ensure that patients have the appropriate resources and assistance from clinicians to abstain from alcohol in the long run. Second, our study points to the need of having better bedside clinical tools to predict sepsis to ensure timely intervention with appropriate therapies in critically ill patients with cirrhosis. Given our knowledge of increased mortality risk among patients with alcohol-associated cirrhosis, as well as the general poor performance of bedside tools for early detection of sepsis, clinicians should have a lower threshold to initiate workup for infection, and also to consider higher level of cares for these patients. Hopefully this will translate into better patient outcomes following intensive care unit admissions. 
Our findings indicate an independent effect of alcohol-associated etiology on outcomes among critically ill patients with cirrhosis. This increased risk persists up to six months of sustained alcohol abstinence, and it is not related to higher rates of sepsis in alcohol-associated cirrhosis as previously shown. Thus, the next step is to determine the exact drivers of higher mortality in this vulnerable population and to implement effective interventions for better outcomes. So we invite the readers to explore the article in detail to first learn about the differences of outcomes in critically ill patients with cirrhosis so we can better take care of patients who are currently hospitalized in intensive care units. One of the greatest challenges to healthcare is the growing prevalence of chronic conditions. Commonly, people now live with multiple chronic conditions even before they reach retirement age. These conditions require that patients and their families access and use healthcare and use self-management strategies at home. When the work to manage their conditions exceeds the capacity to take them on, people experience treatment burden. So my name is Casey Bamer, and I am a health services researcher with the Knowledge and Evaluation Research Unit and the Division of Healthcare Delivery Research at Mayo Clinic. Today, we are discussing the article, Minimally Disruptive Medicine, Progress 10 Years Later, that will appear in the February 2022 issue of the Mayo Clinic Proceedings. In 2009, a clinical strategy called minimally disruptive medicine was proposed to address treatment burden. The article upcoming in the proceedings describes the decade of research on minimally disruptive medicine or MDM that followed and the research and clinical actions still required in the upcoming decade. Specifically, we have advanced our conceptual and theoretical understandings of what contributes to poor patient outcomes in the face of multiple chronic conditions, our ability to measure treatment burden through patient-reported measures, and the development of small interventions that may support MDM in practice. Work still remains to measure patient capacity and implement and test large-scale interventions that support MDM clinically. In regards to clinical practice, a clinician reviewing this work will find potentially novel ways to understand patients who are deemed non-adherent to treatment or have worsening health outcomes. They will also find measures and tools that can help them understand and address treatment burden today. Finally, clinicians involved in research may spearhead work that advances MDM in the coming decade. For patients, minimally disruptive care that is maximally supportive is our aim. The approaches described in our paper should spark more patient-centered, compassionate care. Patients may be drawn to action through serving in advisory roles in institutions that seek to adopt MDM as a clinical strategy. For our next steps in this line of research, we need to advance ways to measure patient capacity and act clinically when patients are in trouble due to low capacity, either because of their unique life situations or because of their symptoms. Additionally, we need robust implementation of MDM at a larger scale that is paired with long-term evaluation of patient outcomes over time. We invite you to read the article and engage with us on Twitter to get involved in this exciting line of research. Thank you for your time. DOAX should be considered as a standard of care for the treatment of patients with cancer-associated thrombosis, CAT, except in the patients with a high risk of bleeding. DOACs, as a class of drugs, significantly lower venous thromboembolism recurrence without a significant increase in the risk of major bleeding. Amongst the DOACs, although apixaban shows the most favorable bleeding profile, but it is really hard to choose the clear winner with the currently available evidence. My name is Irbaz bin Riaz. I'm Assistant Professor of Medicine in Hematology Oncology Department at Mayo Clinic in Arizona. I will be talking about the manuscript, Direct Oral Anticoagulants Compared to Delta Parent for the Treatment of Cancer-Associated Thrombosis, a Living Interactive Systematic Review 
and network meta-analysis, which will be published in the February 2022 issue of Mayo Clinic Proceedings. We have developed a novel approach to creating living systematic reviews and meta-analysis. We show using our approach that we can update the evidence as soon as it becomes available. We use a framework of advanced programming and AI to do that. These results are available on an interactive website that patients and clinicians can use for shared decision making. In this analysis, we combine the data from all four major clinical trials, Hokusai VTE, Select D, Adam VTE, and Caravaggio, which compared DOAX versus Delta Perrin. The results show that DOAX is a class of drug significantly lowered the risk of VTE recurrence in cancer patients as compared to Delta Perrin. There's a significant odds ratio with this analysis of 0.59. In terms of absolute numbers, patients treated with DOAX in clinical trial settings had 35 fewer events per 1,000 patients treated with DOAX as compared to Delta Perrin. In terms of bleeding, although DOAX increased the risk of clinically relevant non-major bleeding with an odds ratio of 1.65, but more importantly, there was no significant increase in the risk of major bleeding with DOAX as compared to Delta Perrin. Numerically, more GI and GU bleeds were seen in the patients treated with DOAX, but we remain uncertain about significance due to small number of events. Some comparisons hinted that apixaban may have most favorable bleeding profile, especially in comparison with Delta Perrin. There was no increase in major bleeding or clinically relevant non-major bleeding as compared to Delta Perrin. However, there were no significant differences amongst DOAX either in major bleeding or the VTE recurrence. Limited drug and food interactions, predictable pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, rapid onset and offset of action, short half-life, and lack of the need for lab monitoring makes DOAX very appealing both for patients and prescribers. This analysis using totality of randomized evidence show that the DOAX are safe and effective and hence should be standard of care for most patients. Numerically higher number of GI and GU bleeding in DOAC group certainly merits caution with the use of these agents in these high-risk patients. I don't think we have a clear answer if a particular DOAC is a winner. Apixaban had fewer bleeding events, but it is hard to be conclusive about it given a small number of trials and the sparsity of data. The choice of DOACs at this stage may be determined by the patient and physician preference, access to drugs, type of insurance, etc. These findings mean more formal access for patients to these drugs, especially as apixaban will be included in clinical guidelines. Real-world studies suggest that DOAX were already a popular choice even prior to the publication of latest trials like Caravaggio. With this data, patients and clinicians can be fairly comfortable with the use of DOAX in clinical practice. We host all this data on a living interactive website, which means that clinicians and patients can look at our website interact with these results, visualize the evidence from different drugs, and see how they compare with each other. We update the data in almost real time so that most updated data is available for clinical decision making. In conclusion, the strength of this manuscript lies in the platform methodology, which allows for inclusion of the new data as it becomes available. As the new data becomes available, website will be updated such that entirety of the data will be included in the analysis. Therefore, I invite you to read this manuscript with a particular emphasis on our approach to living evidence synthesis and future iterations of this analysis. I am here to introduce to you the latest consensus statements on preoperative medication management developed by the Society for Preoperative Assessment and Quality Improvement, or SPACI. Hello everyone, my name is Adriana Opria. I am Associate Professor of Anesthesiology at Yale School of Medicine. I had the pleasure and opportunity to lead the development of consensus recommendations for two of the medication classes, the medications for neurological disorders and those for uh, psychiatric disorders. As with the other consensus statements that were previously published by Mayo Clinic Proceedings, for these particular medications classes, we used a similar process to develop consensus recommendations Given the scarcity of data in um, perioperative management of these medications, we used a modified Delphi process and a panel 
uh, of experts in perioperative medicine from different uh, specialties such as internal medicine, hospital medicine, anesthesiology, or uh, pertinent medical subspecialties have been convened to develop these consensus recommendations. While for some of the medications, it is very clear that these should be continued, given the fact that um, a lapse in uh, taking the medications perioperatively may lead to the exacerbation of an underlying disease for which these medications are prescribed, there are specific considerations for uh, taking some of these medications classes perioperatively. What I would like to do is invite you to read not only our manuscripts, which describe mostly the way uh, the consensus uh, recommendations were developed, but also discuss data that support our recommendations, but also uh, look at the detailed tables we have created in which we also address anesthetic and perioperative medication interactions and um, salient points for postoperative care. As I mentioned, the focus has been in uh, creating uh, recommendations for preoperative use, but we are also touching upon intraop and uh, postoperative um, considerations. So, just to give you an example, if you think about monoamine oxidase inhibitors, they're prescribed either for Parkinson's disease or for severe depression. Generally, when they're prescribed for depression, this is the last resort medication when the patient has failed multiple other medication classes. Traditionally, when prescribed for depression, the manufacturer has recommended discontinuing uh, the MAOI 10 to 14 days preoperatively given um, the numerous medication interaction this class of medication has. However, um, in the past 20, 30 years, there have been developments in anesthesiology with modern techniques being very safe. Um, and generally, this medication, this class of medication is continued preoperatively. However, given the concern um, from our psychiatry consultants that um, it is possible that our perioperative colleagues that would take care of the patient postoperatively may not be as cognizant of the medication interactions. Uh, it may be also um, okay to discontinue the medication 10 to 14 days preoperatively to avoid uh, this medication interaction with a potential fatal consequences under psychiatric guidance. So for MAOI, when they're prescribed for depression, you're going to see the consensus statement recommend uh, two different approaches, either continuing perioperatively with alerting the anesthesiologist the day of surgery that is staffing the case that the patient is on an MAOI or discontinuing the MAOI preoperatively for 10 to 14 days under psychiatric guidance. Another example I can give you is... Um, SSRIs. Generally, SSRIs are uh, a class of medication that is very well tolerated with very few side effects. However, given the serotoninergic um, actions, it is possible that for certain procedures, SSRIs could uh, lead to more bleeding. So, um, while it is safe to continue SSRIs for the majority of procedures, there are some emerging data that for orthopedic surgery, there may be more bleeding, more of a risk of transfusion. That is also discussed in the manuscript. I'm just going to give you these two examples, and I'm going to let you um, enjoy reading our manuscripts. Hopefully, you will find them helpful for your practice with this. Thank you for your attention. This content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research. We greatly appreciate you taking your time to listen. Please tune in again next month when we'll hear about the interesting articles Dr. Nath chooses from the March 2022 issue of Mayo Clinic Proceedings. Hope to see you then.